always nice to be able to uh, to give a talk when you're fed uh, because it takes the pressure off of me because if the talk stinks, at least you were fed. Uh, and, and since about half of you are here for the food, I don't really have to worry about the message. Uh, I, I have to, I plead ignorance. I had no idea I was supposed to be here to talk about practical information. Uh, I have I have that. <laughs> so, uh, and up, up here, just so you can see a, a few props, uh, so you'll get a picture of some of the things I'll be talking about. So first, let's we'll start with a quiz. Uh, which of these has more sugar? How many people think the Twinkie, one Twinkie has more sugar? How many think the, the raisins have more sugar? How many think they're equal? Yeah, so they're about yeah. <laughs> about, uh, about 19 grams, I think, somewhere in that area. Uh, all right, how about this one? Two Oreo cookies, one container of the Yo Play. What has more sugar? Oreos, Yo Play? About the same. About the same. It's about 17, 18, 18 grams. So you all don't know what you're talking about. You need to all take 551 over. <laughs> so one of you know one of the things that's happening nowadays is that there's a bunch of books uh, that are coming out talking about sugars. Uh, here are three examples. Not all of them are against sugar, uh, as you'll see the the middle one here. Uh, Don't quit sugar. We have more coming out. The most recent by Gary Tobbs. Today's book uh, is called Sugars: Cause for Concern and What You Do About Nothing. It's never going to be on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, and our table of contents. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit and just emphasize what our actual subject is. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the sugars and obesity debate. Uh, I'll talk about unique characteristics of sugar, which is uh, certainly my favorite topic. Um, I want to talk a little bit about honey, sugar, high fructose corn syrup. Because there's, I think there's some misconceptions out there about composition, and I'll wrap up. And we'll hope we'll do that in, uh, in 44 minutes. <laughs> Probably less. Okay, so first, just to clarify what our topic is, right? So today, really what we're talking about are added sugars, right? So those that are added to foods, uh, and primarily when we think about these added sugars, pretty much what's on people's minds uh, are sucrose and high fructose corn syrup and some examples uh, over there, uh, as well as the cookies probably that are in front of you a little bit. We're not really concerned with, nor are we talking about intrinsic sugars, which are those associated with things like fruits and vegetables. So, the sugar and obesity debate started back in about 2002, 2003, with people who like to uh, provide correlations with things and relationships. And so uh, a group of researchers decided to correlate uh, an estimated amount of added sugar intake uh, with the uh, obesity epidemic uh, between about 1961 and 1999. And if you do plot this, at least with this particular data, what you see is a fairly nice relationship uh, between the two components. The, the thing to emphasize with this, one, is that of course it's just a relationship and doesn't mean cause and effect. More importantly, though, uh, it's how intake's calculated. And so this particular set of data simply used production of refined sugars and then what's going off of the shelf uh, with, with respect to market, the marketplace. This was overemphasized uh, not only by the media, uh, but also by uh, scientific investigators in terms of uh, what its importance is, and has recently been recalculated. Right, so this is uh, 2013 now, and what's been added here are a couple of things. Right, so what we have, uh, the bars are obesity, the blue are refined sugars, and the high, and high fructose corn syrup is in the red. And we have more data, right, so now we're out to about 2010. The other thing is, is it was calculated a little bit differently in that it took account for loss. Right, so the loss of, of these things uh, in, in the processing and every, every place else. So the point is that the relationship, depending on how you look at it, doesn't look all that great. Uh, but the important message is that if we took the sum of those values out here for refined sugar 
and the sum of the high fructose corn syrup over this time, sum those together, they're going to still be greater uh, than what was occurring back in here. So that's point number one. Clearly, the other point is that we still have an obesity problem. So if you just take it for that, that maybe we, we have an increase in general refined sugar consumption, the question we might pose is what do we really know right now about what we're consuming? And so I hear just to add those numbers up as a starting point, I have them over here. So if we sum these values up here as an average, you get about 85 grams per day. Again, that puts this up here. That's about 340 calories. If you think the average person has 2,000 calorie energy expenditure, we're talking about 17% uh, of the energy coming from refined sugars uh, for the average individual. So now if we look at the data a little more carefully and, and try to assess it more from all of the studies that have been done, um, and I did this this morning. I looked at all the studies. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm actually using a textbook here that, that came out uh, in 2015 for a lot, of, a lot of this data because it was a nice summary. You start to be able to get a little bit better sense of what's going on with respect to added sugar intake. And that, that it's not a single value, obviously, right? It's some range. And so if you look in France, it's about 7 to 13% of calories. Again, these calories would be a total uh, energy intake or energy expenditure, however, however you want to look at it. United Kingdom, about 12 to 20%. And in the U.S., a big range. And so this is something I want you to keep in mind as we're talking. We have people down at the 10% range. We probably have people at the 35% range. It's likely that these are underreported, so it could be even higher in terms of or a bigger range. So what's also uh, interesting to, to think about, oh, oh sorry, one, one step ahead. So just to give you a picture of what that looks like, I guess, I wanted to use some pictures today. So if we, if we take the low end, 10%, that's about 50 grams. And that's what 50 grams looks like, yeah? Mm -hmm. And if we take the higher end, that's about 175 grams a day. And that's kind of what that looks like. So the other thing to think about is where, where are we getting the, the added sugars from? And this is uh, another important point and probably going to be the focus of the rest of this uh, chapter uh, in the talk. And that is, here's sort of the breakdown of, the, of where we're getting those added sugars. And if you quickly notice, and I've highlighted here, uh, that the top two of the three uh, places we're getting it are from drinks. Right? So sugary beverages and then sugar sweetened free drinks. And if you simply just add those two together, over half of those added sugars presumably are coming from beverages. This is kind of interesting uh, because uh, there's a couple of things about getting sugar from beverages that are different probably than getting sugars from whole foods or foods. And, and that is, uh, we drink a Coke, it has 65 grams of sugar, uh, this is very rapidly absorbed, right? So the first thing is, is there's this big flood of sugar entering into the system. And typically, uh, this energy that's entering into the system from a fluid doesn't produce a very good satiety effect, right? So high potential for adding calories into the general diet. In contrast, take the same amount of sugar, put it in a raisin, right? So three boxes of raisins, 65 grams of sugar, it's much more slowly absorbed, right? So the hit on the system is much slower and, and sort of progressive. There's a satiety effect uh, to the raisins. And there's also some other stuff in there that makes it a little bit more, let's say, diverse with respect to what you're getting when you eat it or drink it. So the question I'd like to pose for you for the next couple of minutes is a, diff a little bit different question than just added sugars uh, in the obesity epidemic, but, it, but whether we can reduce uh, sweet and sugar beverage consumption, and is that a, a potential effective weight loss strategy? And my graphics here are nice, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm only going to show you two studies. Uh, first study, replacement of sugar sweetened beverages with water or diet beverages. Right, and so in this particular study, which was published in 2012, they used 318 overweight or obese adults. And interestingly, 84% were female in this study. And what they did is they randomized the groups into one of three. 
right? So the first group, what they wanted to try to do was replace two servings per day of sugar-sweetened beverage with water, right? Second group, same thing, replace two servings per day, but this time with the diet beverage. And the third group was just counsel, right? general weight loss strategies. The beverages weren't emphasized, but were just part of the overall nutritional counsel. The study was six months in duration, and the result was that in both of the first two groups where they replaced uh, the sugar-sweetened beverages, there was about a two or two and a half percent weight loss. No difference between them, probably an important component for you to think about. And if you compare them to group C, this group had a 1% weight loss. So a little bit greater weight loss with the replacement. An interesting thing happened in this study, which was that this group, the primary reduction in their energy intake over the time was from what? Beverages. Beverages also. So for some reason, they reduced their beverage intake. Right? So some reasonable evidence that if we try to replace sugar-sweetened beverages, it can promote some weight loss. The uh, second study, I, I chose this because that was adults, this is adolescents. So this was a little bit of a different idea. It's, it's the attempt to, to try to intervene in the home, right? And so home delivery of diet beverages. They had 224 overweight or obese adolescents, and they were defined as regular uh, sweetened beverage. Can I just do SSB from now on? Thank you. Or SUB, can I do SUB? Sure. <laughs> um, regular consumers. Uh, and, and, and that definition, it was a, at least one 12 ounce sugar sweetened beverage per day. All right, so that was the definition. This is a one year intervention, which is also important because you don't get a lot of long term interventions. And there was also a one year follow up and you had a control group. Here's the intervention. They deliver non-caloric beverages every two weeks to the home. They have monthly motivational calls with the parents, so they've tried to include the parents in this, and they have three check-in visits over the course of the year. Result, <coughs> bummer. No change in BMI at one year with the intervention, right? However, in the control group, the, that group gained weight. That group had an increase in BMI over that period of time. So again, restrained, perhaps weight gain, right, but not, not big weight loss in this group. And not surprisingly, what happened at the one-year follow-up when the intervention finished, right? They let them go on their merry way. Uh, when they looked at the groups, now there's no difference between BMI. So this is not an unexpected finding, right? Because typically people who lose weight regain it, right? And so clearly intervention is important and continued intervention is important. Okay, so, <clears throat> sorry, <coughs> rational summary. I put rational here because I think the whole field of sugar thing is irrational, right? So, not that I'm rational, it's just a rational summary. <laughs> okay, so it seems if you look at the, the data as a whole at this point in time, that interventions that try to reduce SSB consumption do result in reduced weight and fat. The effect is pretty small, and, and again, it's not gonna be typically sustained unless the intervention continues. <coughs> So we have to think about that in the context of how can we sustain any, any uh, benefits that, that are achieved. The thing that, that came across to me that was quite interesting uh, is it seems like the provision of a replacement is really important when we talk about taking something away. And, in, and this is a recurring theme in many of the studies where those that were most effective were those that actually provided a replacement for what they were trying to remove. And again, at this point in time, there's not much data in children and adolescents. So my suggestion uh, is uh, there are individuals in the United States that have a high intake of, of sugar sweetened beverages. And I think that it's a reasonable to suggest that removal of these as part of an overall weight loss management strategy should be an effective strategy for weight loss. You guys doing all right? Yeah. Owen's a speaker. I'm not taking any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I was just wondering if the replacements for the sugar sweetened beverages were cheaper. If if uh, <clears throat> money was accounted for. It's a good question. And in all of the interventions that I looked at, they were provided. So so the so sort of the economic hit, if you will, for having to do that really wouldn't have been accounted for because they were all provided. But I think certainly there's some data 
and maybe we should talk about this at the end. Um, the soda tax is related to this, which was, which was, it seems like any financial hit when you're trying to do to perform interventions of this type are a component of, of compliance. You get, you get my sense of humor. I'm not trying to be rude. Really <laughs> I think I'm rude. But I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, um, all right, so uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about these unique characteristics. I think this is a, personally, it's an interesting area. I hope you find it a little bit interesting. I think most of this may be you know. So when we talk about sugar, it's sucrose. And what's sucrose? It's, it's a molecule of fructose and a molecule of glucose. And when we ingest sucrose or sugar, uh, it's broken down in the small intestine intestine to these two components. So the point here is, is for all practical purposes, sucrose doesn't exist for most of the body. Right? The only places in the body that see sucrose are the mouth and the small intestine. For the rest of the body, it's fructose and glucose. All right, so, so now we've broken this sucrose down into fructose and glucose, and about 5% of the glucose, 5% of the fructose is used by the small intestine for metabolism. The remainder of it enters into the portal vein. The portal vein is the primary blood supply to the liver. You knew I was getting to the liver, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what does the liver do when it sees the glucose and fructose? The liver typically will extract about 25 to 30 percent of the glucose, so then the remainder, whatever's remaining, will go to the rest of the body but a big difference between glucose and fructose is that the fructose that the liver sees, it will extract 70 to 90%. So there's a completely different way that the liver handles glucose compared to fructose, another important component of, uh, that when we think about uh, sucrose, fructose, glucose, all those things. The other intriguing thing about fructose is it's actually also a signaling molecule. So the presence of fructose actually stimulates glucose uptake by the liver. <coughs> Right? So when fructose is present, glucose extraction by the liver, liver goes from about 30% to 40%. Right? Go figure. Right? You know, why does it do that? So my point in, in trying to show you that is that if, if on the left you're consuming <coughs> sugar-sweetened beverages that are, that are containing sugar, they're broken down into fructose and glucose. And that's, and that's what's presented to the body, fructose and glucose, right? And there's different handling of those two monosaccharides. If you take complex carbohydrates in increasing amounts on the right, what's presented to the body is glucose. So you can have two similar amounts of carbohydrates in a sense, but what's presented to the body are completely different mixtures of monosaccharides. So I want to give you a numerical example from a liver perspective. <laughs> so, so let's compare 65 grams of glucose and 65 grams of sucrose ingestion. The glucose, 5% gets removed by the liver, 30% extracted by the liver. That is equal to 18.5 grams of that glucose being taken up by the liver. Okay. What happens with 65 grams of sucrose? That's broken down into equal amounts of glucose and fructose. 5% is lost in the GI tract. The liver takes up 40% of the glucose now, and 80%, I've just taken the midpoint of the fructose, that results in twice the amount of nutrient the liver's having to handle, despite the fact that you started with the same mass of, of nutrient. Are you at the edge of your seats? <laughs> okay. So the liver's in the middle, as it should be. <laughs> so again, starting with 65 grams of Coke versus 65 grams of complex carbohydrates, we get 37 grams having to be handled by the liver in this case. That's 148 calories. Right? If we eat the same amount of complex carbohydrates, so it's half of that, right? And now double it. And now you see the amount that the liver is having to handle. And now triple it. 
And so each time, right, the amount that the liver is having to handle is double the amount it would have to handle in the case of complex carbohydrates. So what's the liver doing with this stuff? So there's a difference between what it's doing and what it wants to do. And this is what it wants to do. That's why the happy face. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so glucose and fructose are presented to the liver. Again, a phosphate gets attached to sort of commit it to metabolism. No big deal there. And what it wants to do is it wants to use these nutrients for energy and to store glycogen, right? Because when we're not eating, the liver needs to provide glucose to the rest of the body. And one of the ways it does it is by breaking down the glycogen. So when these things match up, the amount of glucose and fructose being taken up match up with what these requirements are, everything's fine and dandy. The liver's going to be happy. So when we start to consume increasing amounts of sucrose, we have a problem, right? Because now the liver's having to handle a lot more fructose, a lot more glucose. At some point in time, the amount that's coming in is going to exceed that, exceed what makes the liver happy, right? And it's going to get sad. Right? And it's going to get sad because what it's going to start doing with this extra nutrient, again, and this is just increasing doses here sort of thing, is it's going to start storing it as lipid, and it can start making uric acid from it. Right? And so lo and behold, if you look at the literature from an epidemiologic standpoint, uh, there's a relationship between sugar beverage consumption and both uh, hepatic steatosis, which again is just fat accumulation in the liver, as well as increased uric acid and gout in adults. Right? So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is, is currently just as uh, a big of a problem as obesity. It's affecting 75 to 100 million people. What we're talking about now is ways that the liver accumulates fat, which is the first step of the disease. But when it gets, it gets at this stage of the disease, there's a high susceptibility for the liver uh, to become inflamed and injured, and a high susceptibility for it to become cirrhotic. Right, so this is the cycle of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, of which fatty liver is the first case. And of course, you haven't, many of you probably haven't experienced this, just, but uric acid builds up, forms gout, and it hurts. I, I had my first experience with this a, two, like, a couple of years ago, it was really painful. Does anybody have gout? God, it just, I just it. <laughs> but ultimately, this is from uric acid. Right? So I want to talk a little bit about this because uh, I have a few conclusions that, are, that aren't going to be quite so clear. <clears throat> so what really happens when we think about sugar beverage consumption and liver fat or hepatic steatosis? <clears throat> and so these are, these are randomized controlled trial studies. Now, we're not going to talk about epidemiology anymore. We're going to actually ask the question, what, what, can, what can sugar sweetened beverages do? So there's been a couple of these. They've been relatively short term. But in these cases, what they do is they provide sugar sweetened beverages uh, to increase the energy intake above normal by 25 to 35%. So the point is, is what they're doing is giving sugar sweetened beverages, this is resulting in positive energy balance, right? Excess, excess energy. Something important to keep in mind. <clears throat> the subjects they've, been, they've done this on are, are overweight and obese subjects in one study, and in another study, they were normal weight but had a history of type 2 diabetes. So again, these people are at increased risk for the development of type 2 diabetes. The duration was only 7 to 14 days, which this astounds me. Uh, and the result was that direct measurement of fat in the liver resulted in an increase in liver fat. So in just 7 to 14 days, overconsumption of sugar-sweetened beverages by 25% resulted in accumulation of liver fat in humans. Right? So let's ask the opposite question. So what if we replace sugar-sweetened beverages and does it have an effect to reduce liver fat? And that's what this study uh, did. So in this particular case, 27 subjects, they had an estimated consumption of at least 660 mils of sugar-sweetened beverage. So this is, this is 0.9 mils, so that's 0.45, so somewhere in between there. <clears throat> the subjects were all overweight or obese and they all had liver fat increased liver fat, so steatosis, so clinically relevant uh, disease. The intervention was 12 weeks. 14 replaced sugar-sweetened beverages with artificially sweetened beverages. Those individuals all demonstrated reduced steatosis over the 12-week intervention. 
13 continued their normal intake and there was no change. Right? So again, now if we take a group of subjects, try to reduce the sugar sweetened beverage consumption, you can demonstrate over a relatively short period of time that you can reduce liver fat. So at least it suggests that there, there's a perhaps toggle between sugar, sweet, sugar sweetened beverage consumption and hepatic steatosis. Mike, do you recall if they also lost weight, the ones that replaced it? With yeah, there was no weight loss. No weight loss. Yeah, it was independent of weight loss. Good, great question, though. Now, of course, the intervention stopped. What do you think might happen if we looked at them four months later? Probably the liver fat's going to be back if, if things hold, right, that we know about. Okay, so what about uric acid? So, two studies uh, that have been done uh, relatively recently, both in Europe, I think you'll see why, uh, here. So what they did in this particular, they provided, they asked subjects to, to increase their sugar sweetened beverage consumption by one liter per day. And so that's that. So this is Europe, man. So again, I get it. It's a lot, right? You know, so take, take it with a grain of salt. They were overweight and obese, which is another thing. It's like, wow, like, why would you do it? Uh, anyway, it was six months in duration. Uric acid levels went up about 15%. So not a huge increase, and, and I have to tell you, if you're, if you're not aware, uh, normal uric acid concentrations can vary by about a factor of four uh, under normal conditions, right? And so again, a 15% change is not, is not very, very large, to tell you the truth. It was statistically significant. Another group, they were asked to, to increase 660 mils. <coughs> normal weight, 80% here were female. This was just one time, just drink it. Let's see what happens to uric acid, right? And they looked at it sort of 30 minutes after, 60 minutes after, two hours after. And generally, uric acid levels went up about 5 to 10%. My point <coughs> in showing you this, though, is it's sort of proof of, it's a proof of concept. I was talking to you about <coughs> what the liver is going to do if it gets an excess of nutrient, right? And, and two of the things it's going to do is accumulate lipid and produce uric acid. This is kind of a proof of concept. You drink one drink of 660 ml sugar sweetened beverage and you can at least significantly increase your uric acid levels. Right? So it does suggest the liver's being somewhat flooded and having to do something else with some of the nutrients. Okay. So, uh, conclusion. So sugar sweetened beverages can but importantly, it looks like in the, it's only in the context, at least right now, of excess energy intake, increased liver fat. And sugar sweetened beverages can increase your acid levels. But don't leave here and start concluding that it's the cause of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or the cause of gout. Okay? So, we can't so we can't conclude at this point that sugar sweetened beverages are the sole cause of steatosis in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, nor gout. However, individuals on the high end of added sugar or sugar sweetened beverage consumption will likely benefit from a reduction in intake, and I think that's a safe uh, statement to make. Um, I have a question about that. So, in terms of benefit, are you talking about reducing the well, at this point in time, I'm, I'm, I'm talking specifically about the topic, which is with respect to liver fat uh, and potentially uric acid levels. With this conclusion. Sure, but I guess in a broader context, is there more evidence to suggest that reducing SSBs, which is other health indicators? As, as an example, we've already talked about weight. So now we've talked about liver and uric. Are you talking about what other indicators like? Inflammatory markers, those kind of things. Or <coughs> the the data on inflammatory markers is all over the place. So I think my answer to you would be you could get whatever answer you wanted there. They're not as clear. In these studies, some of the inflammatory markers go up with the sugar sweetened beverage. Some <coughs> they don't. So I'm not prepared to give you a clear clear answer on anything other than these right now. Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about high fructose corn syrup, sugar, and honey, because I like the pictures. <laughs> so question, uh, which of these has more fructose? Honey. Honey, honey has honey, more. Yeah. Are, are your honey 
How many people think high fructose corn syrup has the most fructose? Well, dairy does. A few people. How about sugar? <laughs> Do you think that's less than high fructose corn syrup? Okay, so you think that's less, and, and some people think this is higher, lower? Same. <laughs> Safe. Yeah, so they're pretty close, right? So again, uh, high fructose corn syrup comes in two flavors. 42 and 55, it's no, it's no secret of what that means. 42, there's at least 42% fructose. 55, there's at least 55% fructose. That matches pretty well with what sucrose is, right, which is 50-50. Honey is much more variable, right? So it depends on the variety and things. It's all over the board. And, and these are the ranges that at least I was able to glean. But certainly there are a large number of honeys that have basically similar amounts of fructose and glucose uh, compared to sucrose and compared to high fructose corn syrup. So my statement here is pretty simple. Uh, it's the same statement I just gave, and, and, and that is, if we ask the question, is honey a better alternative sweetener? Uh, you'll find whatever answer you want when you look at the literature. There's, there's, there's no clear answer. Um, the, the data are all, all over the place. Some will say it's a, a benefit. Some will say it's not. Some are studying weight loss. Some are studying inflammatory markers. Some are studying uh, markers of liver fat all over the place. And so it's, it's really a mixed uh, bag of information. And right now, there's no clear answer, I don't think, to that question. But this study was of, of interest to me, and I thought I'd share it with you. It was done fairly recently. And so this was the only study I've been able to come across that actually tried to directly compare equal amounts of carbohydrate in the context of either honey, uh, sucrose, or high fructose corn syrup 55. So these were 28 glucose tolerant and 27 impaired glucose tolerant subjects. So again, uh, these people are at high risk for uh, type 2 diabetes. All of the subjects were overweight and obese. They were provided 50 grams of carbohydrate from honey, sucrose, or high fructose corn syrup for two weeks. The reason this study is a good study is because they actually measured the exact amount of total carbohydrate that was being delivered. So they did a fairly good job of trying to control the amount of delivery. So really, the, to me, what the question here is, is the fructose and glucose in high fructose corn syrup somehow different uh, than it is in sucrose, than it is in honey? Because we're controlling for the amount that we're delivering in the particular study. Again, two-week interval. All of uh, all three of the treatments, honey, sucrose, and high fructose corn syrup 55, resulted in increased inflammatory markers uh, as well as increase in plasma triglyceride. Uh, so again, in general, uh, we, we would uh, associate this type of a change with, with bad outcomes. Right? Not necessarily, but it's not something that we want to see. It would suggest that there's stimulating inflammatory pathways and that there's some excess nutrient being delivered that's requiring that plasma triglycerides go up or that plasma triglyceride clearance is being impaired. Okay, so honey. The good thing about honey is it's more diverse than either sucrose or high fructose corn syrup because it has oligosaccharides, it has some minerals, some amino acids, but it also has polyphenols. So a lot of people are suggesting that honey's you know, this sort of magic pill almost simply because of the polyphenols and therefore the potential that it might have an antioxidant or anti-inflammatory capacities. But that's solely based on data that's taken those individual polyphenols out and studied them in isolation and never in the context of, of, of the honey itself. And again, we just saw data which shows us sort of the opposite effect from the ingestion of honey. The other part about honey that's probably good is that you can find honey with lower sugar content if you look for it. And so, so you can actually find honey that's going to have a lower amount of fructose and glucose in it uh, than high fructose corn syrup or sucrose, at least for the same weight. <coughs> fructose and glucose, though, in honey is not qualitatively different from sucrose or high fructose corn syrup. So again, I ingest honey, break it down into fructose and glucose, that's the same thing to the rest of the body as if I took sucrose in and had fructose and glucose there. Pretty good, huh? Immune <laughs> 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 practice. Of 
course, of course, I have 14 slides. <laughs> Okay, so again, I, I guess I would uh, unfortunately like to leave you with the mundane uh, comment here. Um, and, and I think that it's unlikely that any single nutrient of food is going to be the sole cause of any metabolic disorder. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I, so therefore my opinion is that a lot of the books now that are denigrating sugar and criticizing <coughs> the nutrition community uh, for what they've missed are somewhat doing the same thing that they're criticizing, right, which is trying to link uh, a single nutrient and a magic bullet to a, to a disease. I think it's a bad approach and, and it's not going to be useful or practical for those people who, who need assistance. That just made me really hungry. <laughs> so a reduction of added sugars or, or sugar-sweetened beverages, again, will likely promote some weight loss. It will likely have some benefit for the liver but most likely that's going to occur in individuals that are characterized already by a high intake. So again, the, I think my message here is, is that, that uh, you know, nutrition counseling and changes we make in, in, in people's diets are often not generalizable to a whole population, right? There's a lot of individualism here and we have to take that into account uh, when we're talking to them and when we're providing them with options. So again, this would be only part of what would be a comprehensive long-term health and lifestyle plan. I want to again emphasize, because I think it's really important that this data that seems to be that re re reductions in sugar sweetened beverages without providing an option for a replacement are less effective than when you provide an option for a replacement, I think is an important thing to keep in mind. And again, we always have problem with compliance here, right? And so again, small changes are probably going to be, people are going to be more compliant with, I think, than large changes. I mean, I don't do this for a living, but anyway, that's what I could say. <clears throat> so this, okay, the source of fructose and glucose, whether it's high fructose corn syrup, sucrose, or honey, does not influence how the body handles fructose or glucose. Can't tell you how many arguments I've gotten in, in the past. Last time I gave a talk like this, it was for the extension, I think, on the western slope uh, and and I, I got these emails and said, oh, you know, we really liked your talk. They probably weren't even listening, you know. Yeah. The fact that they liked it is a problem, you know, in a sense, right? But the thing was, oh, I'm going to get my kid on honey. You know, the first thing they say is, oh, I'm just going to put my kid on honey. And you just think, well, they weren't listening. Right? <laughs> because for some reason, there is a, there is, there's, there's a conception out there that if the, the fructose and glucose and honey is somehow different. Somehow the body is going to see that as different or handle it different. So some good things about honey are that it's, it's certainly more diverse in the context that it has some vitamins, some minerals, uh, some, some even have fiber, um, and again, polyphenols potentially. And so it's more diverse than when you compare it to high fructose corn syrup or sucrose alone. And there are lower sugar options available. Um, so at this point in time though, the data would suggest that there's no clear health benefits to honey. Again, I realize health is a broad term, and again, we can talk about that in a second if there's time in the question and answer. So I'm using that fairly broadly right now. Thanks. You know, don't ask, I have no idea. All I, all I did is look at compositions. And, and so there, there are some that I found that had sugar contents uh, that were down in the, like the 40% range. So that the glucose and fructose more, was more at the 20 to in 20% range. I have no idea how they're controlling that or if they're controlling that, to tell you the truth. So. How about lactose? How about it? <laughs> <laughs> is there any, if you were, like milk? Yeah. <laughs> milk's, milk's much better than probably the, these drinks, right? right. If I, one thing just, just to point out there, this is, you know, if you look down here, right, there's some milks that have fairly high sugar content. You know, that's not lactose per se, right? But like, you can't read it right. But so this, that's chocolate. Yeah. This milk, it's 1.4 grams, so it's about half. 
right? I didn't really review the literature on lactose, John, so I'm not, I'm not going to really say too much about it. In the study that you were talking about with the different types of sugars, was the 50 grams additive to their normal diet? Because 50 grams seems like not, not much, if that's more about the 10% range, especially if they're overweight and obese. So it seems like not very much sugar to induce Right. An inflammatory change. So was it additive to the sugars they were already? Eating? Well, so the, the subjects were just asked to eat their normal diet. Okay. You know, and so I guess we were, and and the the intake data that they, they showed in the study was not that great. So it was difficult to tell whether that re resulted in an overconsumption. Mm -hmm. I think we would have to suggest that it did. You know, mm -hmm. you know, so maybe an, an additional 200 kilocalorie boost probably there, and that's probably what happened. It seems unlikely that if energy intake it remains stable mm -hmm. and you added the 50 grams that you probably would have got as big, big of an right. effect and again I want to emphasize there that a lot of the evidence especially with the uh, liver fat sort of concept in uric acid they're all studies where they're they're resulting in an over sort of consumption right, right. so excess energy when you so, had just said it was provided so I didn't know if you yeah, meant the so entire great, diet or just the beverages the, appreciate yeah. the question yeah so, most Americans have an overconsumption Right, right. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not overly concerned. I just think it's a point that people need to, to keep in mind, in a sense, right, at this, at this point in time. The, the reason that's important is because uh, it's very difficult, in my mind, to, to start mm -hmm. identifying uh, uh, how much we should be eating, like how much sugar should actually be in the diet. So, what's the trip? What's the trip switch from the liver being, let's say, happy to not? We don't know what that is. And, you know, and, you know, and so, um, Right now, it's very difficult to start talking about, okay, well, we need to take an individual who has 35% of their calories from, from sugar sweet beverage, we need to take them down to half, and that's going to sort of correct a lot of things. We just, we just don't know those types of things right now in humans. So you said with uh, fructose being added to the diet with it, caloric excess that started the progression of fatty liver disease, but what if they were caloric? Yeah, in balance, yeah. So, yeah that's, so that's kind of what I'm just talking about. I'm not sure. So, so let, let me back up. So the fact that the, the studies have been adding sugar on top of what is a normal energy intake and therefore providing excess energy begs the question of whether any nutrient, first of all, provided in excess is going to do the same thing, right? So is this being driven solely by the fact that we're we, we have excess energies being delivered to the body, and the liver is just handling those, and one way it's handling those is to accumulate fat. Because the liver could, could theoretically right, do that from fat, uh, from protein, or from sugar, right? So versus, is this something special only for fructose and glucose, right? So the only way we could know that is if we were able to replace the carbohydrate content of an energy-balanced diet with fructose and sucrose and ask the question in humans. That hasn't been done yet. So the only thing I can tell you there, and again, you can take it with a grain of salt, and I'm supposed to be practical today in this sense, so I, I didn't want to bring up all of the other uh, studies that I know of uh, that, that address this because they're not addressed in humans in a sense, right? Uh, but if we at least take animal models as a model, and we've studied this for years, and uh, if you keep the animals in energy balance, right, so no positive energy balance, and you simply replace complex carbohydrates with sucrose or fructose at relatively small amounts, about 18%, it results in liver fat accumulation. You predict that in some sense, right, simply because of the different way the liver handles the nutrient. So uh, again, it's, it's simply uh, still needs to be tested in humans, that, that concept. So I hope I didn't confuse you there. Yeah? <laughs> I don't know, Alicia. It's a you know, it's it's a good question. You know, I think, and I'm, I'm completely guilty of this too. You know, our, our general approach is do science and pu pu publish in scientific journals and have other scientists read it. 
I mean, and uh, we're often not uh, the people out there in the media or, or in the public. And a lot of times that's because we're generally not that great of speakers and that charismatic, <laughs> although I think I am. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Well, it's funny that she asked that. I've written a couple articles for the general public in the newspaper, and I get pushback from the general public. Yeah. And I can't be true like yeah, that. Yeah, you know. And, and part the other the other part of it is, and I think this is just I think I, I think you would agree. I mean, generally, uh, you know, trying to uh, engage in a healthy lifestyle is easy for someone who does it, and it's it's made a part of their life. It's very difficult uh, for those who aren't, and and the more more of the population is on the art side than in the bar side, in a sense, right? And so, um, you know, I think I I still think it's probably small changes, but the big thing is going to be is what. The, the output. You know, if we, you know, if we start talking to people and they try something our way, let's say maybe we consider it the right way, and it's not effective, right? They're not going to do it, right? So, so part of it is I think we also need to be very care careful about what we say and what we try, and we need to try to make sure that those have somewhat positive outcomes. So I was inter I was interviewed about three years ago or four years ago maybe by Gary Cobbs. Who, who wrote this recent book. He, he was writing this article by the New York Times, and, and uh, we had an hour and a half conversation, and I think I spoke for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> my point in that was that he was calling me to get my scientific input, and, and, the, and the conversation was like 90% him, right? And so the other thing about it is I think there's a lot of people writing in the media that aren't that generally interested in certainly what I have to say. It doesn't mean they wouldn't be in in what you have to say. It's a cop-out answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if you are constantly taking glucose and flooding your system with glucose to develop insulin resistance and have low glucose tolerance, if you are continually ingesting fructose and sucrose, does the liver ever get to a point where it it's just says, no, stop giving me all this sucrose and fructose, I'm not taking it. Or will it always just keep on piling it in? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. I didn't like what you said at the beginning, you know, which is taking in glucose and, it, and somehow causing glucose intolerance and insulin resistance. And, you know, I'm not sure that that's an accurate portrayal. Certainly sucrose and fructose and glucose. So I, I'll say this in close, and I know we need to, to parts up. The, the, you know, the liver is a, a very interesting <laughs> organ. <laughs> so, uh, and I wasn't, I wasn't entirely accurate with you, uh, you know, about all of the ways that the liver has, uh, has a, all of the ways the liver handles nutrients, right? And so one of the other ways that it handles nutrients is it, it can take them, either fructose or glucose, and, and, and metabolize it and then dump it out as lactate. Right? And then the rest of the body can take the lactate, which is just a three carbon compound, right? product of glucose metabolism or fructose metabolism, and the rest of the body can take the lactate uh, and oxidize it, right? You know, and, and so I think what you'd see in, in your idea, right, is, is that as we toggle things up and, there, and the liver is getting sort of too much, too much, too much, it starts to store some lipid, starts to store some uric acid. It's not like all of the excess is going there, right? What it's going to do is it's going to start dumping more and more lactate out. Right. So, so some of it will be channeled into the to steatosis or lipid. Some of it will be channeled to uric acid. And what you'll find is that you'll have more lactate going out into the circulation. And this has been shown even in humans. That you get big lactate spikes with, with fructose. The problem with that, of course, is the, lac the liver can then take up the lactate again later, you know, so too. So. But again, there's many ways that it could dissipate. Sorry about that. All right, That's as much well, thank you very good. much.